Okay, so as well as after the rainy season, people, um, a lot of businesses close during the rainy season. So a lot of businesses close, even though we said the rain season starts maybe about June, July, a lot of businesses close from about April. Yeah, and a lot of the workers don't, workmen don't work during yeah. the rainy season. So the reason a lot of people stop and close their businesses, diasporans that have got businesses, they close them during April, is because um, a lot of things shut down during Ramadan. So a lot of people don't work during Ramadan and things slow down. And if you've got a business and you are dependent on, you know, the Gambians as well as diasporans, you're not going to have um, many people eating at your restaurant during the daytime. Also, what has an impact is um, we have from the UK anyway, we have two direct flight companies, TUI and Gambia Experience. And both of those stop, they stop at the end of April. Right. And that has a huge impact on Gambian tourism and businesses as well. So a lot of businesses, they actually stop in April. And when they stop for Ramadan, then to reopen back, the, as I said, the tour companies, some of them stop flying. So a lot of businesses have a huge impact. So if they stop in April... Then that is May, June, June July, July, August, September, October, November. So that is seven, seven months, months yeah. so or six to seven months where there's no business. That has a huge impact. We've seen businesses opening in March, not realising that they're going to have six months no business. of no business. And they end up closing in April, May, and sometimes they don't ever open again yeah because at the end of the day with these businesses when you're um looking for a shop you have to pay a year in advance at least regardless so if you sit down and do the maths how much money are you making for the whole year if you're not set up properly your income will be zero yeah by the time you've paid your overheads your staff, your, you your staff, you've got nothing left for yourself. Mm -hmm. And the setup costs are quite That's high. Quite high, yeah. So you need to understand the country that you're moving to. So if it's the Gambia, understand the seasons in the Gambia. Understand the impact of the rainy season. Understand how the businesses work and what is needed in the Gambia. What is an all year round business? Talk to Gambians. Talk to other diasporans that have run businesses, and find out the reality before you actually start your business that's right because the rain season has a huge impact we've done we've talked before it has a huge impact on businesses it has a huge impact on events it has a huge impact on the nightclubs and restaurants that's because right. once the rain starts people don't really they don't, want to go, they don't out. go out so and not only that during the rainy season for a lot of families money is really hard yes there's no work, so there's no money coming in. Yeah, because the hotels the are closed. The hotels are closed, so they're, they're not working. Yeah. Restaurants, Restaurants, tourism. Everything. Yeah. It just grinds to a halt. Yeah. So after the rainy season, all of these businesses and companies, they start repainting. Yeah, so from October, it is just getting ready for the season to start. So they start repainting, they clear, they clean. Exactly what we do in our own homes. So they do it in their they shops. They do that in their businesses in the Gambia, getting ready for the new season to to begin so there's a lot of work isn't there so there is. give yourself at least a month or two months if you've got a compound and business in the gambia after the rainy season to get going yeah. um and, and there is a difference between coming to the gambia and being a tourist i'm coming here for two weeks i'm gonna party i'm gonna go to a restaurant i'm gonna enjoy myself and you know <laughs> there's a big difference in doing that and actually and living. Actually living in the Gambia and coming and cleaning your compound, clearing your compound, transplanting and, you know, standing there in awe of your bananas and your planting <laughs> that you thought would not grow. Because but in the, the fire. hotel you're eating the planting and you're enjoying the fruit. You don't know whose labour that is. That's yes, hard work. It is hard work. Yeah, hard work. Um, so it is lovely. And I'm loving our agricultural group where we're sharing so many ideas and all you sisters who love gardening and who love planting and agriculture. Oh, that is, I can't wait. I can't wait to stop project managing the buildings so that she can so that manage I can actually the seeds, hey, the seeds enjoy what I enjoy, which is swimming in the pool and going in my gym and planting and, going and watering and going to the beach with my dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, and again, 
What has an impact in the rainy season? After the rainy season, your dogs... Your poor dogs, yeah. Your dogs suffer. They, they really do. do. There is something, and it's not nice, it's called mango, mango worms. worms. yes. And the dogs pick them up. You have, to be, you have to be on it, because at the end of the day, the mango worm buries itself into the dog's skin, and it grows. Now, if you allow it to stay there, it will grow and then it makes its way out but it leaves a massive hole in the actual dog's body and that's what gets infected and yeah. that's what causes issues with your dogs if you look on youtube and type in mango worms you'll probably get a video from the gambia with a vet squeezing these fat worms out of a poor little dog so always check your dogs for mango worms i mean i have shepherds so they have long fur. It's a long fur shepherds I have. So the mango worms find it harder to bury into their fur. But sometimes one of my dogs lay on her tummy and the mango worms sometimes burrow into the skin through there. Yes. But if you've got a short haired dog, please always check your dogs for mango worms. It's not nice when the dogs have it and, they are, and it's painful when you have to squeeze them out or take them to the vet to get them squeezed out. Some of the vets, if they're that bad, they put them to sleep. When my dog had mango worms, I had to put a muzzle on her because I know that she's going to start to bite. She doesn't bite, but she'll start to bite because well, obviously it she's hurts. In pain. It yeah. is, it is yeah. painful. Now, you can get something from the vet. It's either a droplet that you put on the back of the dog's neck and it kills all the mango worms and the ticks. The ticks. Um, or you can get a, a, um, a tablet that you put in their food and that does the same. The mango worms and the ticks fall out. It's very, in, you know, it's important to give dogs those things. I mean, you can bring them back from the UK or the US or the Caribbean. Um, they do sell it then. You can bring it back or you can go to a local vet in the Gambia and get, and get that for your yeah. dogs. So, you know, you have dogs and they're guard dogs. You need to treat your dogs well so that your dogs can treat you well. Yeah, they look after you. You look Part after them. Part of your them. family. That's right. Yeah. So, and we are, we've had lots of discussions about dogs. They talk about killer dogs in the Gambia. Oh, well, you know what? <laughs> you do need to be careful because people are bringing in some breeds of dogs that are just not meant for Gambia. And the thing is, if they get out and breed with the local dogs, that's problem. when a problem's going to start. Yeah, definitely. What we need is protective dogs. Dogs that are going to protect you on command and dogs that understand how to protect you. Um, but we don't need dogs that are, you know... If the gate is open, they'll be let loose and they will harm somebody, you know, in the community. That's not what we need. We need dogs that are protective dogs and that can be trained to be protective. If you go into somebody's compound over the wall and you're not meant to be there, then you cannot blame anybody for dog attacks you. Yeah, but, because uh, you've got no rights to be there. Mm -hmm. You haven't knocked the door and somebody say, Jamalo! <laughs> You're learning the language. Of course, of course, yes, yes, yes. But, you know, if you're going to climb over the wall and you're going to let yourself into someone's compound and dogs come and attack you, that's, that's your fault. Yeah. Because you have no rights to be there. Yeah. So, you know, when you've got dogs in the Gambia, um, especially if they are hybrid dogs, you know, that are bred for protection, when you're not in the Gambia, be very, very weary of who's looking after your dog. Make sure they're feeding your dog. Make sure they're not abusing your dog or beating your dog because that same dog can turn on you when you come back. That's right. Make sure... The treatment they receive, they never forget. And make sure they are not breeding your dog without you knowing. Because if you've got a male dog, they can take money. Whoever's looking after your dog can take money and give your dog out or bring female dogs in for them to breed and then sell the puppies. Yeah, so make sure they're not giving your dog, male dog, out to breed. And if you have got a dog in the Gambia and you've brought them in for protection and they're a dangerous breed in other countries, then if you castrate that dog when you bring them into the country, I'm not advocating for castration, but I'm saying to keep Gambia safe. I know people that have castrated their male dog so their male dog cannot breed with um, other Gambian dogs. Which is the, the, the best thing to do. I mean, like V said, when I... We're not saying, yes, you've got to do it. But at the end of the day, it's just safeguarding. Yeah. It is safeguarding. Yeah. You know, there's lots of children, you know, local children. Yes, they tease the dogs, etc. But at the end of the day, you don't want to know that this big, huge 
massive dog or a, a pit bull or whatever is going to come and attack a child because at the end of the day it's in him or in her mm. yes and if you have got a if you're buying a dog and that dog is not a puppy you need to be fully aware of the history of that dog um because you know as we said dogs remember cruelty and they can very quickly turn on you if they don't know you or you you know you don't know their history um, a lot of dogs are abused um and a lot of dogs they get stones thrown at them they get beaten um so yeah if you're going to have a, a dog as a pet look after your animal and know who's looking after your animal when you're not in the gambia that's right and after the rainy season again check them make sure they get regular uh, checks from the, 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 health the vet, check. health checks, make sure they're fed, feed your dogs, feed them properly, a, a, a couple of spoonfuls of rice every day is not sufficient, it's not sufficient for your dog, um, your dogs then will be hungry and they'll go hunting for chickens and hunting for anything that they can, <laughs> yes yeah, so if I've got chicken next door and your dogs are hungry, they're coming for my chickens, they'll come for your chickens, that's right, <laughs> But actually, they might come for your chickens even if they're not hungry because well, they, they, are, they, they are hunters. They, they, yeah. <laughs> so not all hunting dogs will hunt for food. They can hunt as a sport in a it's sense. It's a game. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And when you've got more than one, they're pack animals. They're so they will, my, my dogs, because there's more than one, they will just jump on whatever. Um, but yeah, they are protective dogs. They are. Yeah. Okay. So that, that, that's dogs.